Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar of the Gerhard Center webinar series, The Aftermath of COVID-19, The New Social Impact Ecosystem. Today, we are honored to have with us Professor Peter Norinka, Professor of Private Sector and Development at the International Institute of Social Studies of Erasmus University, Rotterdam. He will talk about frugal innovation in Africa, an academic and policy agenda. The webinar will explain frugal innovation, a simple, affordable, robust innovation developed for under, or under conditions of scarcity. In many cases, also with more careful resource, uh, resource use or making use of renewable. While convention innovations are often over-engineered and thus initially too sophisticated and expensive for middle-class and poorer consumers, frugal innovation are developed specifically for less affluent users. The next step is to discuss three main types of frugal innovation. Innovators, firms, NGOs, citizens, provide some examples and then go through how some such frugal innovations has become a focus in academic studies, trying to make sense of the importance of the innovation outside of the R&D departments of large companies in the ongoing digital revolution. The final part of the presentation <clears throat> puts forward some ideas on how frugal innovation thinking can dynamize policy agenda, uh, uh, agendas on, for example, agro-industrialization and local economic development in Africa. Uh, Peter Norinja is professor of private sector and development at the uh, ISS, as I've mentioned, of Eras Erasmus University, Rotterdam. His research focuses on how entrepreneurs and firms impact upon attempts to achieve more socially responsible and environmentally sustainable forms of development. He has worked on small and medium-sized firms, entrepreneurship, local de economic development, industrial clusters, role of trust and networking, global value chains, private governance and sustainable standards, and more recently on frugal innovation. He's one of the co-founders and president director of the Leiden Delft Erasmus Center on Frugal Innovation in Africa based on the, in the Netherlands. Without much ado, Peter, floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Ali, for uh, this wonderful invitation. Let me see if the share screen works uh, again um, in the way it did while we were practicing. Yeah, it, it works, I think. Um, you can see it. The only thing I don't see yet. Um, is how to, yeah, okay. Um, in, the, um, in the series of the, the webinar, uh, there was a very important sentence for me. It's that uh, you aim of discussing concepts that are currently not mainstream and may, or perhaps should become mainstream in the aftermath of COVID-19. And, um, I think frugal innovation could be one of these concepts, or I'm, at least in this presentation, I'm going to try and convince you of the fact that frugal innovation might be one of these new concepts that we can usefully bring in in the aftermath of COVID-19. Uh, the presentation will talk a little bit about definition, uh, who are these frugal innovators, then I'm going to talk a little bit about the academic agenda and the policy uh, agenda. First, something from just a few weeks ago, um, a team of people led by Yusuf uh, Bilasanmi, who is a PhD student um, from uh, Nigeria, who's doing his PhD in the UK, and they developed a new low-cost uh, ventilator, which doesn't need electricity, um, but could help hospitals to treat COVID-19 patients. And in the, um, the news block from the university, they say, um, this innovation is simple to use, it's low cost, non-electric and oxygen efficient. Now, especially these first two elements are part of our working definition of what we call uh, frugal. Literally, frugal means sparing or thrifty. It is also often um, labeled as being careful use of resources and increased use of renewables and a strong focus on making things simple and smart. Now, this does not mean 
old or outdated technology. Um, it often makes use of fourth industrial revolution technologies, like for example, um, something that is widespread in Africa, uh, M-Pesa, which is quite uh, technologically advanced in the back office, um, but it is very simple, easy to use by consumers, and it is an affordable and simple way to be able to transfer money without having a bank account. Mm. Prove innovation for us focuses on the combination of low cost and high functionality and the reduction of over-engineering, which is maybe the most important uh, focus point when you think of the pandemic. Um, and it focuses specifically on low-income households. So while traditionally or conventionally, innovations tend to be relatively high cost and sophisticated, frugal innovations by contrast actually focus specifically on lower-income households and try to make these products, services, and systems simpler, more robust, and easy to use. Now, this um, discussion around frugal innovation is becoming increasingly on the radar, both in the policy debate, um, like the recent study done by the uh, European Union that you see here on the left, on frugal innovation and re-engineering of traditional techniques, and also in the academic debate in a recent uh, set of papers in um, an issue of nature uh, with a focus on sustainability. Now, I will first say a few things about the academic debate. First of all, this is not a new thing. Yeah? Uh, already Adam Smith, the uh, godfather perhaps of economics, who was a philosopher uh, by training, um, already talked quite a lot about frugality and frugal. Um, in his uh, inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, his most famous book, he uses frugal or frugality 37 times. And the quote here is from the theory of moral sentiments, his other famous book, frugality is important in the process of producing economic wealth. And at the same time, to avoid a destructive cycle of commerce, leisure, luxury, and corruption. Um, and this, is in the 1700s. Yeah. Now, the attention for frugal innovation got a new boost uh, around 10, 12 years back uh, when The Economist started talking about it. And there was a book by Navi Raju and Jadip Prabhu on frugal innovation, how to do more with less. When you look at how the uh, academic debate is evolving at the moment, we see three sort of recent streams in the literature one that focuses on technology and engineering, looking at the innovation process and the stages in the innovation process uh, with a focus on issues like value sensitive designing, robustness of innovations, simplicity and affordability. A second stream focuses on entrepreneurship and management studies um, with a focus on issues like the base or the bottom of the pyramid and looking at how through innovations can be a very successful commercial proposition for companies that are targeting um, middle income, lower middle income and poor consumers. Um, it also talks about uh, social entrepreneurship as a way to achieve um, societal goals. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. The third stream is about development studies and sociology. This is about how poor people innovate and deal with scarcity. This is where terminology is used around grassroots innovation, jugat innovation, a Hindi word for frugal, and bricolage, the French word for trying to make ends meet with the limited means that you have available. In this literature, there is now also increasing focus on what are the economic, social, and environmental impacts of frugal innovation. Um, we often see three quite different types of frugal innovators. Um, and I want to briefly mention them and then I have three slides with examples of these three um, types of innovators to indicate the kind of diversity. Uh, first of all, firms that develop frugal innovation to make profits and penetrate new markets. 
Secondly, NGOs, often with donor funding, that develop frugal innovations to address societal challenges like the Sustainable Development Goals. And third, individuals and communities who develop their own frugal innovations to address their own bottleneck. Even though I'm now splitting them up in three, maybe the most important point to mention of the different types of people involved in frugal innovation is that these are usually not developed by one person or one set of persons in isolation. Almost all the more successful frugal innovations are examples of co-creation and using many different actors from different locations with different kinds of knowledges. And of course, in these interaction processes, we need to be aware of power differences between the different actors involved in developing frugal innovation. Now, an example from the firm sector, um, from health, is the portable electrocardiogram from General Electric, a, a portable machine developed specifically for rural areas in India, making it much more uh, easy, cheap, and simple to measure the basic heart functionality. And for 80 or 90% of people that feel that they, there is something wrong with their heart, this basic machine is enough to decide whether or not they should actually go to a major city with a big hospital or not. Um, interestingly, this machine is now being sold to um, general practitioners in, for example, the United States and in Europe, who have this machine in order to be more critical about whether or not they should send uh, patients actually to the hospital for further checks. The second category, NGO, social enterprises. Um, this is just a picture from a recent prize that was um, given by the European Union on affordable high tech for humanitarian aid, where the frugal innovation that uh, got one of the prizes was a um, um, one of these uh, um, uh, 3D printing designs to help with actually uh, printing in uh, refugee camps, uh, components as parts of um, water taps. And these are a few examples of what we often call individual or more community uh, frugal innovations that are based on the ingenuity of uh, people trying to solve their own problems, coming up with really interesting and important innovation. The additional debates that are now coming up in frugal innovation are about scaling and governance. For example, in the provision of basic services like water, energy, health, uh, while also looking at the political economy and societal impacts of frugal innovation. And we see, but that's really just starting. And, and it would be great if maybe some of you who are listening to this would later say, oh, well, I'm interested in something else, like, for example, sustainability, climate change, green transformation, circular economy, and, and the list is, it goes on here, uh, industrialization, food security, intellectual property rights, take your pick. For many of these topics, a frugal angle can make a nice new dynamic to your study. And this is what we're trying to uh, promote also. Now, moving to the um, policy agenda, there was a recent report, it's uh, I think 2018 or 2017, by uh, UNCTAD on new innovation approaches to support the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, with a kind of confusing terminology, because that is the world that we are in at the moment, in, in the sense that while conventional innovation is increasingly seen as quite limited. The sort of adjectives that we put in front of it to sort of broaden up the debate are not yet sort of uh, crystallized out. So whether one uses frugal or social or inclusive or grassroot or jugat innovation, these are all attempts at trying to grasp at a broader meaning of um, the innovation policy agenda. Yeah, so first of all, this is about the innovation beyond only commercializing scientific discovery. 
and it is beyond public sector R&D investments and incentives to large firms, but a more frugal approach to simultaneously address rising inequalities and environmental destruction. And this is at the moment being uh, discussed in sort of policy agendas at quite different levels of analysis. Yeah? First of all, the mission-driven innovation strategies, which is um, an instrument now very much sort of promoted also by the European Union, but you also see it, for example, in the um, uh, 2030 vision strategy of Kenya. Um, there's a lot of discussion about it in South Africa and in many other places um, where it's not so much the innovation as such that is the key thing, but it is all about what are the major mission issues that you need to address, yeah? Um, and that could be a sustainable city or making sure that all the plastics are out of our environment or other kinds of major missions. And within that, it is increasingly recognized that we, of course, we also need high-tech fundamental new scientific breakthroughs to find solutions to these bigger missions. But we also need more inclusive, more sustainable, more localized involvement of people with great ideas at the local level who have the experience and the knowledges about their own context. And putting these together is one of the ways to broaden the innovation policy agenda. Same is true in industrialization policy. Um, and I have another example on the next slide for sort of more local development uh, perspective. In local innovation practices and resilience, the idea is about how do you combine effectively local knowledges with new technologies and research and development expertise through adaptive learning and innovative business models. Now for that, one needs to rethink more societally desirable innovation trajectories with again a focus on reducing this over-engineering. Yeah, over-engineering is one of the main ailments in our modern society. And at the simultaneously to involve lower income innovators and citizens in what kind of innovations do we need to address our major uh, challenges. And doing that in a way that focuses on adaptation, simplicity, and functionality. And coming back to the COVID-19 uh, discussions, where we have seen that um, in many countries, in the medical sector and in getting approval from, from ministries and from uh, medical agencies, et cetera, there was a break on many of these innovations because they did not yet follow all the optimal standards that have been set for equipment and for um, other kinds of issues in previous years. And that it is now time to uh, focus much more on a good enough instead of optimal practices to enhance resilience and increasing the speed of local innovation processes. To conclude, a focus on frugal innovation does not mean we want to do away with investments in R&D or with investing in uh, high-tech innovations. But we need to connect the two processes. So these frugal innovations, social innovations, inclusive innovations need to be woven into the innovation agenda as a way to make policies more inclusive and sustainable. Um, at our Center for Frugal Innovation in Africa, we engage in an empirical research agenda to see under what conditions frugal innovations are more likely to contribute to addressing the sustainable development goals. And I really look forward to those of you who want to um, get in touch with us uh, in the coming days or weeks. And I have our website here on the next and final slide uh, to sort of get in touch with us about the kind of research that you are doing or the kinds of policy that you are involved in and whether you can see how maybe a frugal approach or a frugal solution might contribute to dynamize the thinking around these issues. And in that way, to make frugal innovation part of that new agenda in the aftermath of COVID-19. So thank you very much for your attention and I look forward 
to the discussion. Uh, thank you, Peter, for a, a very uh, precise and to the point and yet very wide scope presentation. Uh, please, if you have any questions or comments, please write it in the chat box. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the discussion with, I, I remember in almost more than probably 10 years ago, there was a very interesting case of uh, IDO, the uh, design thinking company. And they had a new project of a venture to develop the visor. The visor was one of the early PDAs and it was supposed to sort of replace the competitors, uh, popular Palm 5, which was much more expensive. The interesting thing that I've noticed is that most of the students that they took, it's an MBA course. Most of the students that they took this course thought IDO should not worry about low cost products. There is this entrenched mentality that innovation means leading edge technology and expensive technology and otherwise don't bother. Now, my question to you is how do you overcome this mindset? And become more practical, more pragmatic about developing things, which is much needed, as you said. <clears throat> yeah, well, maybe, um, shall I stop the sharing and maybe we can see also a few other people? Yes, 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 yes please. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, maybe that is uh, right at the start, the $100 million question, uh, <laughs> Ali. Um, when, when I teach about this, I often start with uh, asking people to put their mobile phones on the table. Um, and there you see the same thing. Um, most people use less than 20% of the possibilities and opportunities that are actually on their iPhones or, or uh, Nokia's or, or where, whatever they are. Um, but they're still willing to pay also for the other 80% that they're not using. Um, and changing that mindset is perhaps one of the most uh, difficult things um, that we have to um, engage in. What, what I'm not uh, advocating is that we should all lead uh, much more simple lives uh, uh, because that I think is a dead end uh, because that I don't think is going to happen. But I think the combination of convincing people about <clears throat> the need for a more sustainable production and consumption system to have a livable planet also for next generation and to make the connections more visible between these different um, logics. Um, I think that will make it possible to uh, argue in favor of these more frugal solutions. There is, however, a very unfair dimension to that, which I'm very much aware of. Um, what we're what you're basically saying also with this approach, if you're going for more frugal consumption and production patterns, is that those who have lived in poverty until now and who are sort of starting to become middle class will not be allowed or not be able to enjoy the middle class style of the uh, Europeans and Americans of, from the 1960s to the 2000s. Because if we would all consume as the average American, the, the planet would have exploded by now. So um, this is not an easy sell, uh, obviously. And at the same time, I think it's very necessary that we need to understand that we have been in a way, um, we got used to having so many trinkets and bells and uh, additional features in our day-to-day -day machineries, but also in the hospitals and also in, in our cars, things that we seldom use and that most of us really don't need. So there is a lot of scope for making things more frugal without actually taking away any of the consumption enjoyment in consumer behavior. But it's not an easy sell, I realize that. Right, right. Uh, I'm gonna take questions from the audience and then I come back to my questions and comments. I'm gonna start with uh, Ronald uh, Bardi. Please uh, unmute yourself, Ronald. Yeah, good afternoon or good evening. I did a work in Ghana and I came across uh, in the north of Ghana, I came across 
two very important issues I want to think, ask about if you also um, think that this is a valid issue. One is indigenous wisdom. We have such a big treasure in these countries and they did their inventions uh, with this wisdom. And uh, to some extent, uh, they are neglected in the Western world. To some extent, I think we should uh, make much more um, use of what has been uh, known for centuries with agriculture and health in, in these. And this is also a type of, I was a revitalizing innovation. Yeah. The other question is, um, uh, on my work in Ghana, I came in, onto the uh, United Nations Education Centers for Sustainable Development. They have a, a, a big program with this uh, uh, about 100 regional centers for expertise. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you, I didn't cooperate with them because my assignment was relatively short, but I think that's one thing I would like to know of you. Uh, uh, are you connected and how do they work? Because there is always much advertising and you never know what is. And the last word, um, I, when, when we were asked to give a question in, beforehand in the seminar, I came across a wonderful term in, in, in the Nigerian language, which is kanju which means resilience, but it means to build back better. So innovate while rebuilding. And that is also, I think, an issue which you have come across. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Kanju indeed, um, um, sort of building back better resilience uh, would be another example of the sort of uh, basket of labels that at the moment we are sort of considering uh, like, like frugal or like inclusive or social um, or jugat in terms of thinking again, more deeply about the role of innovation and what kind of innovation do we actually need for future development of our planet. Um, so yes, very much so. I don't know much about the uh, UN Education Center for Sustainable Development, I'm afraid, but I very much like your first point. So I would like to say maybe a little bit more about that. Um, the indigenous wisdom uh, in, in areas like agriculture and health and the importance of revitalizing that know-how. Um, I think that is a critical issue. Um, there is a, a PhD st student at our center who's actually researching um, on these kinds of um, uh, knowledges. Um, and I think I actually saw his name also uh, somewhere um, in, um, um, on this list. So maybe he can comment on this himself uh, uh, later on, Virendra Singh. Um, what is important to mention here indeed is that um, while on the one hand, these indigenous knowledges are of critical importance at the same time, they cannot on their own be used to address also, for example, uh, the newer problems uh, around climate change and um, uh, environmental uh, degradation. So we need to find ways in which these um, indigenous knowledges and wisdoms together with new kinds of insights that come maybe from um, uh, new technologies, uh, for example, combining satellite uh, images with uh, local knowledges. Um, that is the kind of uh, combinations that we need uh, to uh, address our major challenges. Thank you. Uh, the second is, uh, question is coming from El Hassan El Sabri. Please unmute yourself, Hassan. Oh. Hello, uh, so my name is Al Hassan Sabri. I work in the areas um, of uh, innovation management and um, um, uh, university industry collaboration, especially in developing countries. Um, uh, you made a point about the um, uh, relationship of frugal innovation to, um, to uh, intellectual property. And I would like to, uh, to hear uh, more uh, from you, um, uh, you know, expanding on this issue because 
um, um, on the one hand, there is, you know, this, this drive to um, uh, sort of document all of these frugal innovations, make uh, especially those by communities. And uh, even I think at the American University in Cairo, they, they have this uh, one, one of the research projects is uh, ongoing trying to uh, uh, the, the scientification of, of, you know, sort of uh, popular uh, public innovation. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, um, there is always the emphasis on, um, you know, we need to deal with this as different from how we deal with, for example, commercialization of the academic knowledge or those kinds of, uh, you know, standard um, uh, innovation uh, paradigms or, or uh, frameworks. Um, so I would like to hear your point, your um, uh, take on, on how we should approach these issues uh, g given those two uh, sort of opposing approaches. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's also indeed a very important point that I just sort of mentioned in half a sentence. Um, <clears throat> our experience so far is that with, um, let's say, lawyers or uh, people in uh, legal uh, departments in universities who specialize in intellectual property rights, they are not very um, eager and often also not very able to understand the logic of these uh, localized, more informal uh, frugal innovations. So, like you said, there is indeed a kind of um, a mismatch between the kind of people that look at these uh, local community innovations and try to sort of document them and perhaps preserve them and to some extent try to uh, arrange also property rights for these innovations, as, as for example, the uh, National Innovation Foundation in, uh, in India is, is, is making an attempt in that direction. But there is quite a gap indeed. Um, however, there are initiatives, for example, from uh, WIPRO, the, uh, the, the World Intellectual Property Rights Organization. They now have a separate group of people working on what they call informal sector innovation, which again is a somewhat different label for trying to do the same thing, uh, which is to broaden the innovation debate and to also look at what is happening under the radar of the uh, patents uh, uh, dynamics. And I think that is where um, the, yeah, very important new research needs to be done. And it would be great. I, I met last year, uh, just before the lockdowns uh, started and um, I met uh, a lady from uh, Nigeria, who was a lawyer by background who was interested in this, but we haven't really sort of made any progress. Uh, but this is typically something where sort of uh, people with a legal background, but who are not in the sort of mainstream formal sector pattern dominated logic, but who are willing to step out of that and, and work together maybe with people that are focused on grassroots and frugal innovations to think about how to set up an intellectual property rights system that can work for these informal uh, innovations. I would leave it there, uh, Ali. Okay. Uh, Fayez, Sheikh, please unmute and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Professor Ali, and uh, <laughs> thank you, Professor Noringa. Hello, uh, greetings, from, greetings from Kashmir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, I'll definitely uh, speak from uh, Professor Noringa's uh, COVID-19 uh, comment. I think COVID-19 has offered a brilliant window of opportunity to realize um, uh, the significance of these bottom-up innovations. We have seen how these bottom-up frugal innovations have offered a glimmer of hope uh, when formal systems failed. Uh, then these alternative non-formal innovations started filling the gaps. And we have seen some recent articles which appeared in Nature, Harvard Business Review, and some other leading uh, news magazines which talked about these frugal and uh, bottom-up innovations. But you know, while comparing frugal innovations from India and with uh, frugal innovation and technology which is coming from China, uh, you know, I could see the role of government becomes very important. Although, uh, you know, this whole frugal innovation discourse uh, and grassroots innovation discourse, particularly, it started from India, and uh, you talked about National Innovation Foundation. You know, that's the only organization in India which has documented more than 300,000 
uh, bottom up uh, these grassroots innovations. And India is the only country where these local innovators, bottom up innovators are honored by the president house, by the president of India. Uh, but if you look at uh, the China case with the Indian case, uh, the successful models are coming from China, precisely because the role of government is very explicit and uh, the role of universities is playing a very dominating role. So that actor sector collaboration uh, in terms of scaling up these bottom up innovations, you know, that's more vibrant in China, uh, while as in India, you know, we don't have that uh, vibrant or robust actor sector uh, involvement. And the second important thing which I observed from India and China was connecting frugal innovations and bottom-up innovations with digital technologies. Uh, so I was trying to know from Professor Noringa, like uh, uh, what kind of you know, insights or how would you uh, see frugal innovation in a post-COVID world uh, where government have to uh, intervene with you know, latest uh, you know, innovation frontiers, for example, digital technologies, artificial intelligence, is there any such scope uh, where government can play a very dominant role in terms of scaling up these bottom-up innovations? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Fayaz. That's, um, that's indeed an important question. Um, as you know, I know more about India and Africa than I know about China. So it's a bit difficult for me to respond to the, the, the China-specific point, but I think your general point indeed is that uh, we should look more carefully also at the role of government to make these kinds of frugal innovations also scalable and meaningful for more people. And in, in that sense, um, I would say, yes, there is uh, now also starting in Europe, uh, typically enough. Uh, I was uh, in a number of seminars with people in Brussels over the last uh, six months or so that Increasingly in, in Brussels, they are starting to see that their innovation uh, strategies are also too exclusive and too much for sort of one high-end group. And they are struggling to find new ways uh, to, to broaden the horizon. Um, however, in, in many of the poorest countries, um, giving the government an important role in bottom-up or frugal innovations is also quite risky in terms of um, uh, capturing um, the benefits and the, the, uh, the whole logic of uh, these uh, innovation processes that need also that kind of flexibility. So it's, it's possible where the role of the government can be indeed conducive to this kind of innovation processes and, and helps to be more inclusive and sustainable. Um, and of course, this is not the moment or the place to discuss whether the Chinese government is um, fulfilling that uh, sort of characterization altogether. Uh, but it is clear that in China, it is very commonplace that in whatever new development takes place, the government takes a lead role and it has pros and cons. I, I don't yet see how that would translate in a similar way in, for example, India or in, in Africa. Um, especially, well, it depends a little bit on, on which countries in Africa you're talking about, of course. The, the other point you made, the connecting through innovation with digital uh, uh, solutions, I think, yes, that is, that's definitely part of the future logic. Um, the, the digital revolution is really a revolution on, in which we are only sort of yeah, we are in the midst that we don't know exactly where we are. We know that it is changing a lot, maybe not everything, but a lot. We don't know yet very much about how it is actually going to impact systematically. Yeah, but uh, digital technologies are of course becoming a general purpose technology like electricity in a previous industrial revolution. So yes, um, it is almost unthinkable that there will be really successful, scalable frugal innovations in the next 20 years that do not have also a digital, a strong digital uh, connection. And for me, that is also one of the reasons why the present frugal innovation debate is different from, for example, the appropriate technology debates in the 1970s and 1980s, um, that this is a, not about um, a romantic, uh, 
ideas about the past, but it is about trying to find more inclusive and sustainable futures. And that includes uh, both communities as well as NGOs, as well as uh, small and medium scale enterprises and multinational corporations and government. So all actors have a role in that, um, in that game towards the future. I will leave it at that, uh, Ali. Okay, uh, uh, Thomas, please unmute yourself, sir. Hello. I'm, I'm audible, right? Yes, please that, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Peter, for a very uh, elaborative presentation. I am, in fact, a student of Peter at ISS. Uh, I come from India. And uh, uh, some of my, uh, I have a couple of questions regarding uh, one issue is, uh, I mean, you have detailed, in, uh, detailed uh, about uh, different conceptual and theoretical understanding about the uh, different kinds of innovation and fragile innovation. So uh, some of the things I have been into, in, into various healthcare, uh, public health innovation for almost 15 years. So some of the challenges for uh, the innovators are one is the visibility, how uh, the innovation could uh, take uh, into the commercial space through larger visibility. And secondly, in terms of scaling up, how could we uh, uh, take it forward, scaling up require funding uh, and also technical uh, uh, expansion. So there are a lot of other things involved. So, uh, and the, the, in, in the third uh, important thing is like the uh, government level involvement in terms of uh, regulation, but uh, the, uh, the uh, other kind of uh, accreditation and all these things. So my question will be uh, how the Fujil Innovation Center or, or the kind of thing that you are proposing uh, will uh, help uh, the innovators in terms of these three areas, like for example, one is visibility, and then in terms of or the potential funders, and also the third in terms of connecting with the government in terms of the regulatory uh, this thing. So, how do you think uh, the innovation center that you are uh, proposing will help uh, the innovators in these directions? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Tom, for that uh, question. Um, that's not an easy question. Um, let me start by saying something which you shouldn't take as defensive, but we are an academic center. So we are not actually uh, consulting um, with the, uh, the frugal innovators themselves. We are trying to understand where and when these frugal innovations are more likely to make uh, positive impact. Um, now, how do we do that? By looking, among others, at successful examples, but also at failure cases, and to try and learn what the differences are and how we could advise, for example, uh, governments, NGOs, and companies, um, and communities to develop frugal innovations that have more chances of um, scaling successfully. Now, in terms of visibility, scaling, and government regulations, or the role of uh, dealing with the state, um, you know, as well as I do, that um, many of these sort of smaller um, locally successful initiatives, once you try to scale them and make them more visible and big and, and important, um, other things start coming into the picture. It becomes also a matter of uh, uh, some political power, maybe some uh, local elites would become suddenly interested in what you are doing. Um, and because of the need for, for example, economies of scale, uh, technical expansion, the, the original innovation may lose part of its soul in terms of how it was uh, set up and how it was sort of um, imagined in the first place. Uh, and then you also often see that uh, people from the outside that were not involved in initial stages are trying to take over. Um, so 
making people aware of these um, relative risks involved in um, scaling these kinds of frugal innovations uh, is an important part of our uh, responsibility uh, to not be uh, naively promoting these kinds of innovations as we know that there are, especially in the processes towards uh, scaling and increasing visibility, there are also serious risks involved for the people that were involved in developing the initial innovation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Singh, you, you had, you, had a, uh, you raised your hand before, are you still? Yeah, Virendra Singh is, is the, um, the person doing the research that I talked about. So uh, if he is willing uh, okay. to speak, that would be nice. Okay, I think he, he logged out. So anyway, will uh, Carla, Carla, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the webinar. It's, uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, I'm doing my master's thesis on the topic of uh, reverse innovation. So um, developed countries have um, realized now as well that uh, frugal innovations are also relevant um, to developed countries. Uh, as uh, Professor Nolinda mentioned, uh, the, the first example from General Electric in the health sector. And there are many health innovations from India, for example, and my question is, um, why, or do you have, uh, um, why do you think some innovations, some frugal innovations, are able to scale from countries such as Africa and India to developed countries? Because this has happened, and why others fail? And the ones that succeed, uh, my question would be, um, do you think that um, these developing countries, such as Africa or India, where these frugal innovations? have their origins, if they can somehow benefit when these innovations um, diffuse to uh, developed countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that's a nice question. Um, it's uh, what indeed in, in Europe is called reverse innovation is, um, is becoming increasingly a hot topic. Um, like I, I mentioned also that, that the EU in Brussels, they are now uh, looking at these kinds of innovations. There was a recent um, UN report on um, the 50 most important innovations in health re relevant to COVID um, from Africa. Um, and uh, first of all, there is sometimes a kind of hesitation in, uh, for example, in Europe, um, thinking that uh, how could good innovations come from, let's say, Egypt or, or Tanzania or, or Kenya or, or South Africa? Um, and of course, that's, they're wrong about that. That's of course is very much possible. Now, why do some fail and some uh, succeed? I think the ones that succeed in uh, becoming also important in Europe are the ones that uh, have a combination of um, reducing this over-engineering while at the same time being able to claim relative high quality because that is often the reason why um, reverse innovations fail in, uh, in richer markets. If the average consumer, and that comes back to Ali Avini's uh, question at the beginning, if consumers in relatively richer environments get the feeling that they are being given a sort of second rate substitute for the real product. And if once that happens, then people become relatively uneasy and restless and, and the frugal innovation is likely not to become successful. But if they can combine uh, reducing the over-engineering, having a reasonable uh, low cost price, good um, functionality, then some of these examples are really uh, successful. There is one other limitation um, and that has to do with the slowness of change in rich uh, economies. Yeah, for example, uh, the way in which mobile banking or mobile money transfer has boomed in, uh, in Kenya, in Tanzania, Uganda, et cetera, et cetera. And also, for example, in China, in the countryside. While in the US and in big parts of Europe, this is going much and much slower. Now, of course, because of the pandemic and shops closing and online shopping becoming more important, it has now gotten uh, a relative boost, but still, uh, this is um, 
major issue is with reverse innovation is that the speed of innovation adoption in Europe and the US and, and in Australia and Japan is much slower, especially if innovations come from the outside. And in that sense, I think uh, many countries in Africa, but also in India, um, and of course in China, the, the adoption of innovation rate or speed is much and much higher. And it's an open question for how long the, the European Union, for example, can still claim that they are the innovation hub of the world. Um, I think in the next 10 to 15 years, they will be um, passed by, by uh, innovations coming from other parts of the world. And that's not a radical thought. I think that is simply an observation on the basis of how things are developing. I'm not sure I've, I've completely answered your question, uh, Carla, but I hope you will write a good thesis uh, on this. Let us try uh, Bahindra again. Uh, Mr. Singh, would you please uh, unmute yourself? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Avni. And thank you, Professor Noringa. Actually, I'm on travel, so I cannot open my video. Actually, I'm in car. Don't okay. worry. Just, I'm driving. Just ask you a question. I'll comment about yeah. what, what... So... Uh, yeah. So, actually, I don't have any question, but I have a little bit, uh, like, uh, a small response about the question raised by Ronald on combining new technologies with the local wisdom. Because yeah. my research is related to that particular point. So my experience till so far is a better understanding of local knowledge systems or local wisdoms is important, especially when we deploy or when we try to, to give people certain solutions designed by the outsiders. So to minimize the hierarchy or the politics already embedded in, in local systems to, to minimize that conflict where new and old, both kind of knowledge can come together in a more synergetic way rather than in a conflicting way. So the better understanding of local traditional knowledge is important, one thing. And second thing, frugal innovations are often a combination of the knowledge systems or knowledge is coming from a different sources. So I think that is also important. So that was the response I wanted to bring in to the discussion. And thank you, thank you so much for a nice conversation and, and, and exciting talk. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Miranda, for um, making this good addition. Yeah, and um, travel safely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please don't yeah, use thank you. wide while driving. <laughs> okay. Uh, had other comments, please? Uh, Hassan, would you unmute yourself? And, and... Um, yeah, uh, thank you for giving me the chance again to ask uh, it's a core topic I'm quite uh, uh, passionate about. I studied under uh, Dr. Sunil Mani when I was in Japan. And ah. And of, uh, yeah, very uh, into this topic. Uh, so um, being an academic, I, I would like to ask you if, um, um, you know, because working on the university industry collaboration in developing countries, I always uh, I realized there's, um, um, there, there is a, um, um, sort of, um, it's, um, you know, it's very difficult to apply the kind of literature you find on university industry collaboration in developed countries on situations in developed countries. Uh, because, you know, equipment and, you know, facilities in the universities are different, needs of industries and companies are different. Um, so I was wondering, um, you've already in, uh, put uh, firms as, or companies as one source of um, uh, frugal innovations uh, in, developed, uh, in developing countries. Uh, I was wondering if you see universities in the same uh, lens as well. Um, there's so many, uh, of course, there's so much advanced research going on in, in many developed countries, in many developing countries, 
But at the same time, um, uh, many of the um, uh, research projects, especially you know, graduation projects of students, um, uh, those kinds of things, uh, especially in certain fields, uh, these are uh, not what you would classify as you know, uh, uh, um, uh, pure um, academic innovation in, in the sense that you would do this in a, in a Western university. Uh, I was wondering how you see the uh, universities uh, in, develop, in developing countries in, uh, in this lens. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That, that's an, uh, a very important question also. I, I see an increasing uh, commitment um, by universities uh, across the world in um, trying to develop, for example, projects for, for master students or even uh, for uh, uh, bachelor students uh, and also for PhDs that sort of combine issues of um, innovation, uh, developing new technologies, uh, new designs with uh, societal impact aims. So with uh, a conscious combination with ideas around uh, promoting inclusion uh, and sustainability. Um, we are at, at the moment finalizing um, a handbook on frugal innovation and there, there's one chapter from um, universities in Brazil that are involved in this and one chapter from universities in South Africa that are involved in these kinds of activities and that are consciously trying to sort of together with the local communities that they work with to also train their students in seeing both sides of the coin in a sense that uh, you want to develop new things but at the same time you want to make sure that they are not too distanced from what is happening um, uh, in the locality, uh, often relatively near to the university. So it's, it's also about, like what, what Birendra was, uh, was saying, that um, in many cases, these, these two exist as, as separate silos and bringing them together already in your uh, educational path, I think is critical. And in that sense, universities have a very important role to make sure that the next generations of, of researchers as well as policymakers and practitioners are much more able from early on in their career to combine these pathways of looking for innovations that stimulate new economic growth, as well as those policies that uh, uh, stimulate uh, inclusion and sustainability and not to treat them as two separate things where you first try to create growth and then you try to repair, for example, inequalities or clean up environmental destruction. And I, I do believe that universities have a very important role in that. At the same time, we all know that in, in many of the poorer countries, it's very difficult for universities to actually play this role because of underfunding and, and, and other issues uh, in these uh, universities. But in principle, universities have a key role in promoting these kinds of dynamics and logics for more frugal solutions uh, to our societal challenges. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, well, we're almost getting to the end of the time. I'm gonna exercise my power as a moderator. <laughs> and I, I just have two comments. The first comment is that when we talk about frugal innovation, we should not ignore process innovation not just about product innovation. There are many examples, in, especially in medical operations, of brilliant frugal innovation taking the cost down. This is the first comment. The second comment is uh, there is an interesting parallels between the lean concept, which was basically started end of World War, World War II, Japan, uh, very minimal resources, huge ambitions, and frugality which was developed at most of the people in India. One of the interesting things also, the concept of lean, the lean startup, the concept of a minimum viable product, which is, yeah. which is exactly what you've mentioned. Forget the bells and whistles, they don't add value, just get, give me something that works, that delivers. I just wanna get your feedback about this before we wrap up. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I can be brief about that. Um, First, you're very right in saying we should not ignore process innovations. The only problem with, for me, in a sort of trying to be brief and quick in a presentation is that the product examples are easiest. They, people can immediately see that product. 
Uh, but you're very right. Um, the process innovations, but also the business model innovations are often at least as important for Frug innovations as compared to the actual designing of the product itself. Often it is in clever new business models, like for example, with uh, solar energy, um, that people don't actually need to buy the, uh, the solar panels, but they just pay as they go while using them or leasing them. Um, so the innovation is often in the process, it's in the business model, it's in the systems. And, but, but that's my only excuse that the product examples uh, in a presentation like this. Um, on, the, on your other point, yes, I think uh, Lean and Frugal have much in common. Um, and uh, it is in a way, uh, I mean, one of the major differences was, I think, if I, if I remember correctly from what I did as a student um, on, on lean production in Japan, et cetera, um, is that it, it was less concerned with issues of inclusion and sustainability. It was more about increasing the efficiency in the production process and in indeed having a no frill uh, solution to things like the sort of re-engineering the American cars in Japan and coming up with a car that could do the same thing with half the number of components in it. Um, but yes, uh, in terms of reducing over-engineering, there are strong overlaps. Um, and I think we can bring a number of these ideas together in thinking about future models that are relevant for both business school teaching but also development studies uh, teaching. So I, I think we have a common um, um, challenge there that it would be good to, uh, to work on for the coming years. Okay. Sir, I, I really thank you for a, a very interesting webinar, very uh, thought provoking. Uh, it's it just been a great discussion. I really thank you. Uh, My pleasure. I thank you all for participating in this webinar. I look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday, March 24th. We will have the presentation called The Business of Changing the World. The speaker is Raj Kumar. Raj Kumar is the president and editor in chief of DevEx. <clears throat> I look forward to seeing you all. Again, thank you, Peter. Thank you all for participating. Bye-bye. <clears throat> thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Peter. <clears throat>